Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, philosophy and vision define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's rising stars in the scientific firmament. He works with the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Bombay, was the winner of the S.S. Bhatnagar Award in 1999, uh, has been a guest lecturer at uh, Harvard University, at Princeton, in Paris, at uh, major institutions around the world. His area of interest and scientific focus, perhaps, has been uh, in uh, string theory and, and quantum physics, in which he has written and published extensively. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Sunil Mukhi. Uh, Sunil, tell me, uh, you have written extensively about string theory and uh, perhaps an unfair question to ask you um, as a lead-in, uh, a, a brief encapsulated uh, explanation. What is string theory? All right. Well, string theory is a logical extension of the theory of elementary particles. And actually, to explain it, uh, it's just enough to explain that we believe Nature is described by very microscopic elementary particles. You've heard of them, electrons, uh, photons, quarks, things like that. That's all very conventional physics in the sense that it's established rigorously. But it's physics of the late, uh, mid and late 20th century. And there's one sense in which that uh, set of theories is stuck. It has a problem describing uh, the quantum effects of gravity. Gravity is a very familiar Let's force. Let's go back a little bit. I think yes. we're already getting, I'm I'm getting a little lost yes. on, on uh, uh, quantum theory of, of, of gravity. Uh, tell me, uh, is this an attempt at a, at a sort of uh, universal theory of everything? Oh, yes, absolutely. In what ways? Well, uh, in fact, we have a universal theory of what I like to call uh, three-fourths of everything. So uh, in a very precise sense, three-fourths of what goes on in nature is explained by particle physics. So it started off before that, in a sense, the first attempts at, at a unified uh, a theory, you know, long before uh, Einstein sort of gave it to popular, uh, um, how do I put it, a popular wisdom, popular vocabulary, uh, was the whole notion that everything was made up of earth, fire, water, and, and, and the basic elements. That Indeed. was perhaps the, the first attempt at this. And then it evolved, and, and Einstein postulated a, th a theory, and it was his dream to try and demonstrate that this was possible in his own lifetime. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, forgive my partial understanding of this. No, no. Uh, and, and then the, the, the string theory became an attempt at, at bringing, uh, bringing uh, together uh, some kind of explanation that would um, lead to a synthesis of an understanding of this. That's right. Uh, what are the, some of the key elements? Well, the key element really is that an elementary particle isn't a particle at all. It's actually a string. So it's an that elementary as particle that. is really what the electron, neutron, protons are made of. That's right. Uh, and, and what is an elementary particle? Let's get well, elementary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good, yeah. that's perhaps the best question. <laughs> so the electron, let's focus on that. It's what carries electric uh -huh. current. And as far as we know to this day, it's not made up of anything. It's elementary. There's never been any evidence that inside the electron there's something else. And so we, instead of, so we stop asking that question, we say, well, this is a fundamental particle. It's not made up of anything, but other things are made up of it. Now, that's conceptually sort of difficult to, to grasp, that you know, we describe it as it, and yet we say it's really, it isn't really anything. Uh, sort of, if as a lay person you would try to intuit it, you'd say, well, this is sort of, electrical charge. It doesn't have form and substance, but it is something in some ways. Well, it has substance. It has a weight. So in fact, it can be characterized by its weight and its charge, as you said, and by one or two more things, and by the way it behaves. But indeed, you're right. I mean, there isn't anything else you can say about something that's fundamental by definition, because that's what there is. However, in contrast, the proton is not fundamental. The proton is made up of quarks, and it's the quarks which we believe are fundamental. So in string theory, we believe this is very speculative. String theory is not yet a confirmed theory of nature. It's an idea that people are working on. That uh, electrons and quarks, if we looked at them very close, would appear as little loops of a string. And it's the string that's fundamental. So what is, what is the significance? How does this begin to point to this unified theory of everything? Well, um, there's only one thing probably that's easy to say about strings. Um, in lay language, which is that unlike particles, which are points, 
strings have an extent. So they are one dimensional. There's a length along the string. You can have a stretched string this long. You can have a round string that's closed. So they're extended objects. And for some reason, which is essentially technical and it's um, hard to explain in, in brief, um, such an extended object is better suited to describe gravity than a point-like object. All attempts to describe gravity through point-like objects have failed so far, including the attempt start initiated by Einstein and others. I think we're, we're also looking here at how uh, a theory uh, would explain multi-dimensions, many dimensions. And uh, I was reading somewhere that uh, this points to the possibility that there may be not just three or four dimensions, but there may be ten dimensions of which six are sort of uh, in, in, in folded in, 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 in together. That's so right. what are some of the, the, the implications uh, <laughs> of, of the string theory? Uh, you know, beyond just looking at, 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 at the loop there, but what does it mean? Well, this is certainly one of the weirdest things about string theory, uh, that it requires extra dimensions. Uh, but first, I'd just like to mention that for reasons which have nothing really to do with string theory, it was in the 1920s that a couple of physicists in Europe did propose that we uh, live in dimensions higher than the three that we know experimentally, and that the other ones are, so to say, small. They're curled up in a way that we don't observe them directly, but we could observe them indirectly is what they hoped. And they observed that if such a scenario is true, then the theory in the higher dimensions would be simple, but the effect of these extra dimensions would be to give us the complication of the real world that we observe. So we observe a world that's undeniably complex. It's full of complex things like this glass or like you, know, like you or me or a statue or a, you know, a light bulb. But the underlying theory should be very simple. And the hope was that by going to higher dimensions, we can find a theory that's simple. And actually, string theory, in a certain sense, is very simple. In a sense that one of the, the, the imperatives of the need uh, for a theory, uh, at least in terms of my very limited layperson understanding of, of a very limited reading of, of Einstein uh, relativity and, and, and unified uh, uh, theories, was, was that you needed a theory because it wasn't possible always to find a scientific validation uh, for every single uh, aspect or, or, or nuance that came up. And if you had a theory, then you could use that to explain and, and to slot things into a map. That's certainly true. In what ways does uh, the string theory uh, facilitate that? And, and to what degree does it really provide a map that works? And, and, and how much of a map is it? Well, if string theory is right, then all forces in nature arise from the force between a pair of strings. That means electric, the electric force, magnetic force, nuclear forces, gravity, all of them arise from that. And so once we understand string theory enough, and I emphasize we haven't yet reached that stage, then uh, we should be able to make predictions based on string theory. And from one uh, mathematical framework, we could predict uh, something about interactions between different planets, or something about the way black holes behave, something about the way terrestrial experiments, uh, accelerator experiments would give certain results. So at a very fundamental level, this one theory should explain all these things at once. So what are the implications? Once it gets proved, it's established, what does it do for science? There have been, so many, there have been a number of Nobel Prizes uh, that have been awarded for people working in this area. Why is this so profoundly significant and important? Well, let me first say there haven't been any Nobel Prizes for anyone working in string theory. And that's because uh, Nobel Prizes in physics are never given unless the theory has very, very definite experimental confirmation, and which is not present in string theory. But since string theory is an extension of conventional elementary particle physics, yes, indeed, in that field there have been several Nobel Prizes. And many of the people who got those prizes are now working on string theory because it's the logical next thing to do. Now, um, so let's see, what was your question about it was the, a, what is the what is the What is the implication? How is this going to impact? Ah. Uh, science? Yes. Um, well, there are two levels at which this is usually answered. One is that if string theory is true, it's fundamental knowledge about the universe we live in at the deepest level. And, that all, and if it's true, then such knowledge is deeply satisfying because it's a knowledge for all time to come. It might be extended, it might be improved, but it's basic knowledge. Um, in the same sense that Coulomb's law, which is the law of attraction or repulsion between electric charges, is fundamental knowledge. Uh, the second thing is that such fundamental knowledge always has applications, 
but they take a while to come and it's very hard to say what they'll be. Nuclear physics, which was uncovered only in the early 20th century, at first was an attempt just to understand what's inside the nucleus. And really because we had instruments which could dig deep inside the atom, we could ask what's happening there. And surprise, we found radioactivity and we found nuclear forces of binding and so on. And you know, eventually nuclear uh, energy and nuclear weapons, for better or worse, are all developments that came out from that. Assuming that it's, it's proved true, and, 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 and obviously uh, uh, scientists uh, such as yourself have, have a, a reasonable hope, a reasonable assumption that it will be proved true, in what ways might it change uh, the way we now look at, at, at the universe, look at the, the fundamental things that we talk about? Here I'd like to quote something that Stephen Hawking said in his book, A Brief History of Time, and I, I like that comment very much. He said that in the past we've always been uncertain what the fundamental theory of the universe is because of this missing ingredient of quantum gravity. And he says that if string theory or anything else closes the gap and gives us a fundamental theory that's complete. Then he says, uh, the person on the street who wants to know something about the real world can finally start to learn this theory because until now we've been chasing different theories and they might be wrong. I wouldn't advise people to start studying string theory that seriously if they're not scientists because actually it might be wrong. But once it's known to be right, then I think I would advise everyone to learn, everyone who considers themselves a little bit intellectual and has a curiosity, to learn some basics because it's real truth. It's really, it would then be really, really true. And uh, well, I think then society can be much better educated about what the fundamental laws of nature are. But very often that uh, isn't, um, and you know, we'll, we'll come to this. You, you practice a form, you know, you do, you do vipassana meditation, you're interested in sort of a, a Buddhist, uh, you know, dare I call it cosmology, you know, vision of the universe, where everything is really, in a sense, relative. So is there, is, is, is there a final, definitive truth, a theory that's going to stop there? We always find, you know, we thought the atom was the ultimate particle, we found something else, and we found something else, and it's, it's, it's layered, and it's, it's a never-ending process of discovery. You're actually right. At the beginning of the 20th century, I think, or maybe in the late 19th, uh, there were statements going around that physics is basically all over now. And it was just before relativity and quantum mechanics completely turned everything on its head. So it would be kind of foolish to um, assume that this will be the end of physics. But uh, it might be, I mean, it's just one doesn't know. And people have argued, very, you know, very brilliant physicists have argued that fine, you know, there were many false conclusions that it was all over. But maybe now fundamental physics could be over with the end of, uh, with the, dis you know, with the understanding of string theory. And maybe then we turn our attention to different kinds of problems. Or it may be that this is open-ended and we'll find more layers. I just don't know. For a, a physicist such, yourself, such as yourself, how do you, arrive at an, an area of, of, of focus, interest, overriding professional passion. Uh, was there something more than just an academic uh, interest that, that, that drove you to this? Was, did it sort of touch some personal chords of, of curiosity, of energy, of striving? Well, I wish I could say something very noble, but I think I became a physicist more or less by accident. And I think I really began to like it uh, after I had got into the field. I don't think I was that fired up in the beginning. In fact, I think I'm more fired up about it now than two years ago. I think every, every year that I learn something more, I'm more excited uh, about the subject. So it, there are other people who from childhood or from high school know that they just have to do this, but I don't think I was one of them. But what about once you got into, the, into physics, uh, this particular um, discipline, this particular focus on, on, on string theory? Yeah, that actually was uh, another accident which um, is quite uh, amusing. When I was doing my PhD, this is around the late 70s, uh, my advisor put me onto a problem which seemed to be a model mathematical calculation of something that had no physical relevance. Uh, and it was a phenomenon that took place in two space-time dimensions, one space, one time. So it was viewed as a, uh, as a toy model of something. And I did a long calculation, we published that. And two or three years later, we all realized that this calculation actually had been a calculation in string theory, something that certainly I didn't know about at the time. And that the two dimensions was the fact that a string is a one-dimensional object moving in time. It sweeps out a sheet. 
and we had been studying something that happens on that sheet. We didn't know that. It's the common hap happening in science that you study something which looks nice and then you realize that it's actually something else, but you didn't realize that. So that's how I came to interest in theory. But has there been any sort of a, a personal uh, a relationship to it beyond the professional? Uh, let's see, what would a pers personal <laughs> relationship to it I be? Mean, do you feel that, and I, I alluded to, 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 your, to your interest in practice in meditation, um, we will talk about music and, and uh, you know, your, your, your passion there. Um, you know, very often there are, there are correlatives between what you professionally pursue and, 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 and a grasping, in a sense, in, 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 in physics for empirical truths. And, and then going into the processes of the mind, uh, which involves, uh, particularly in Vipassana, mindfulness, of surrender, of letting be, of flow, and, 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 and coming to maybe a more um, a personal metaphysical realization. And I've also sort of heard of uh, uh, there being five string theories and, and then sort of being clucked together and looked at M theory and then saying, is this, does M stand for metaphysical? Does it stand for, what does M stand for? Well, we'll come to that again. Just looking at this metaphysical aspect, that, you know, this process of surrender of relative truth, which meditation leads you to. How do you reconcile these? I don't know. It's really hard for me to answer that. I think uh, I might just be a very boring person who compartmentalizes all these things. It's true. I like music and I like meditation. It might be true that they influence my way of doing science. But, and also, uh, for example, in the lecture I'm giving later today, I've used music extensively as an analogy for string theory. But I think of it only as an analogy. And uh, I find, for example, music satisfies my aesthetic uh, being. And of course, so does science. But science has some kind of very definite rules and procedures. And I'm not sure if I do something very different from other people. I think most string theorists work in a sort of roughly similar paradigm. I, I don't know. I'm, yeah, I would have liked to <laughs> connect all the different parts of my personality. But perhaps they aren't really that connected. So let's look at, 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 at a physicist looking somewhat schizophrenically at meditation. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, what are the processes of, of, of meditation and, and in what ways uh, do they sort of affect you, impact you, how do you approach it? Well, you know, I think in the modern world people go for meditation because they're stressed. I think it's one simple reason. And I think uh, among people who are stressed, there are those who will admit it and those who won't. I think one fine day I said, I just have to try this out. I wasn't stressed badly or, you know, in very bad shape, but I just felt stressed and it didn't seem right. And in meditation, I learned that you can actually calm the mind down. And by doing so, your thoughts become much, much more clear. And whatever sort of true nature or your true inner nature sort of can come out because you're not blocking it with layers of, of emotion. And that's really all I learned, and it was a revelation, certainly, because it's, it is absolutely true. In fact, you know, meditation is a completely scientific thing, which they tell you, do this, and this will be the result, and it's certainly true. Mm -hmm. So what is, uh, what is the result in, in, in quantifiable... The result is theory? that instead of having conflicting currents in your mind and feeling that you're constantly at war with yourself, you feel much better with yourself and better disposed to everything, and in short, less, uh, less conflictual. I think there's a personality type that's conflictual. You're always looking for a battle to fight and so on. And um, sometimes that doesn't help you win the battles you want to fight. So it's actually better not to be conflictual and still carry on your battles in a calm frame of mind or carry on your work in a calm frame of mind. Just going back to this and, 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 and nudging you a bit to sort of explore this seeming dichotomy uh, in, and if we were to try and develop a, a unified theory of the individual, uh, our work, uh, the process of surrender in meditation, and the process of uh, uh, firm, empirical, focused investigation uh, in the physical sciences. Is that's it? really difficult. I guess in some ways that's really the next frontier. I think what, you know, what we know about abstract nature, but not abstract, about nature out there, and the planets are much simpler than human beings. They do what they're supposed to do, and they never deviate from what they're supposed to do, and they never make up their own minds about anything. You know, the planets just do what they're doing. The electrons just do what they're doing. Not necessarily being predictable. And it's not clear to me, certainly, why we are here and what we are supposed to do. So I think a science of human beings 
if there's really going to be one, is probably very far in the future. I'm impressed by what I know of psychology, uh, psychiatry, modern um, understanding of uh, mental processes, even some aspects of genetics. But uh, it's clearly not quite there. I mean, we are much further ahead in physics than, say, in the study of the brain. So if you're interested in uh, music, and, and you know, you said that this, this satisfies an aesthetic need. Is the aesthetic need, again, a part of sort of, we've all, we already have three dimensions of you. We have the scientific aspect, we have the, <laughs> the spiritual, or I don't know if you want to use the word spiritual, the meditative one, and we have the aesthetic one. Uh, what is this? This, this, this need, is it, another, uh, is it another sort of reaching out to equilibrium, to insight, to processes? Uh, what, what need does music fulfill for you? I wish I knew, actually. Uh, the only thing I can say, if it's any use, is that probably I'm as interested in music as I am in science, and uh, it could have taken just that little bit to do music instead of science. but. Uh, the good thing is that while being a scientist, I can still appreciate music. I'm not sure that being a musician, I would have been able to appreciate science because that's a much harder subject to start off with. But uh, you know, if you ask what need, uh, I don't know. I just like it. Uh -huh. You you know you you run a personal uh, a website and you have links on that to uh, uh, a site that you you maintain on Kumar Gandharv on on music and you know there are lots of links I noticed on that to to, to music. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's more than uh, just a, a fancy or an interest where you sit down, listen, enjoy it, and it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's an abiding passion. And you mentioned that little sort of, sort of missing one uh, over the other by a narrow margin, in a sense. Would you have been a musician? Would you like to have played music? I would have liked to sing, actually. Uh -huh. uh, I actually, by the way, I did learn to play the sitar from the age of 11. It was just something my parents got me to do, and I enjoyed it. For seven years, I learned the sitar. And I can sort of play, not too badly. But then, you know, vocal is what, vocal music is what uh, took over my interest. And so if I had to start again, probably I'd like to be a vocalist. And uh, again, there's something very elemental about vocal music. I'm sure it's clear to everyone. Going back to this, this M theory of, uh, of, 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 of the string theory, um, there are seemingly five different string theories. And the M theory is what brings it um, all together. What is the justification, what is the value of um, the, sort of the whole process of scientific investigation, the huge amounts of money uh, that are invested in, in, I was going to say the pure sciences, uh, in, in the short term they are pure, they, they find application much later, much of it is speculative. Um, and, and, and they create a context for, for exploration, for these journeys of of, of the mind, as it were. What value uh, does it have to the state of the world, uh, to the state of uh, poverty, to development? That's a very good question. Uh, let me start by saying that you know, M theory or string theory, these are very small corners of fundamental research, basic research. And they're very cheap, actually. I'm one of the cheapest, uh, <laughs> cheapest scientists in the country. All I cost the country is my salary. And uh, so these being quite speculative and very much at the forefront, uh, even if they aren't finally right or in some sense we're doing something that doesn't work out, I wouldn't feel too bad. I think it's not, it's a theoretical enterprise. We are excited to be in it. And I don't think people are spending that much on us. On the rest of fundamental science, money is being spent especially on two frontiers, I would say. One is condensed matter, the physics of materials, uh, the interest in semiconductors, superconductors, things like that. And the other is in fundamental particle interactions. And there we talk about accelerators, detectors, and so on. And uh, quite a lot of money is spent there. And you're right to ask why, for example, India should do, if that's your question, why should India spend money on such things? Well. All I can say is that India certainly had a policy of spending some money on these things. And it's paid off because intellectually we have a very high profile in the world. It's assumed that an Indian will be very intelligent and well educated. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. But it's assumed abroad, especially in the US, and especially after the software boom, but also before with Indian doctors and uh, scientists, that we'd be very intellectual somehow. We've got that image. And just to give an example, a country like Thailand, which has not made this kind of investment, 
but which probably has better primary education, uh, doesn't have that intellectual image. And I think an intellectual image gives a lot of self-confidence to the country. So this investment probably in the long run is for national self-confidence. There's a great deal of debate going on on the you know, funding and support of uh, higher education uh, in, in, in much of the Western world. This is driven by, uh, by commerce that uh, industry funds research and then it tends to fund research in areas that may have potential application, as you mentioned, material sciences and semiconductors and what have you. Where is the, the source of support likely to come from for uh, the research in, in, in the pure sciences uh, in, in, in a world that is rapidly uh, globalizing, is, is, is rapidly privatizing um, most, most, most aspects of life? Well, of course, you know, university systems that are publicly funded will, I think, continue to be publicly funded for one good reason, which is that, after all, we scientists who do research also teach. And uh, we should teach. And, it, you know, we are good at teaching because if we, you know, if we have worked this hard to learn physics, I think uh, we all are actually good at teaching physics. So if you want physics taught even to engineers or to anyone else, uh, research scientists are good at it. But if there are definite projects uh, research projects that are expensive and if national agencies cannot afford them, I would expect private donors uh, to come forward. They have done in many parts of the world uh, with the enlightened view that a little bit of funding for basic science and a little bit of funding for technology makes a package that uh, will benefit everyone in the long run. I'd like to mention here in, in Israel, the Weizmann Institute for Science is largely funded by contributions. It has plaques all over the institute saying, you know, this is the so-and-so laboratory of something. And we'd, I'd like for us to be in a similar situation where in, uh, industry is funding us in a sort of combined model, both fundamental and applied uh, research, and not asking for immediate gains, but believing that there'll be long-term gains. What has been your experience as uh, an Indian scientist educated in the West, acknowledged, applauded in the West, and coming back and, and, and working here in India? You know, the story is a legion. Of, of the many scientists who were brutally almost uh, treated on, on, on their return uh, and, and you know, abandoned India for Western shores. What has been your experience? What have been your motivations? Well, I, yeah, I certainly took it as an axiom that I would come back and live in my own country. I just didn't want to be a foreigner. And actually, as it turns out, I'm living maybe you know, 10 kilometers from where I was born. And um, I'm just so happy with that. And when I came back, now, there were one or two cynics, not I have to say in my institute, but outside who said, oh, you know, you've come back to India, it's such a slovenly country, it's so filthy, and you know, what will you do here? And there's, you know, I was furious with those people because here I was idealistic, and they were trying to sort of discourage me. Maybe they just felt embarrassed about India for some reason, but the, my institute was wonderful, it's always been wonderful. I'm very, very proud of this place, uh, the Tatra Institute in Bombay. And my colleagues are wonderful. I think what what I belong there for is the colleagues. And what vision does a scientist uh, have for himself? I mean, he has a vision of, 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 of string theory, uh, changing the way we look at the world. Um, do you have a vision for yourself? Might you be the person who will bring all the elements together and, and, and make it happen so that it will become a, uh, well, a mukhi string theory? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone should have that ambition. Uh, but. Uh, I wouldn't bet on uh, on myself being the one, frankly, if it was a question of betting. But everyone should have that ambition, yes, because actually science has this wonderful democratic thing that uh, you know anyone can have the insight. It doesn't really, if we look back at insights that happened in the past and which led to major revolutions, you could largely say that uh, one of many people in different countries could have had that insight. And uh, certainly the conditions in fundamental science in India today are such that such insights are possible. I mean, we certainly know enough, and we are certainly enough in the field, and we are insiders. We could have that insight, yes, I agree. Dr. Mukhi, amen.